Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I really am grateful for you being here today, given that it's such a beautiful day outside. I think we'll have some fun. And I'm not the director of the program, but in our small program, uh, besides Ed Vasquez and Ken Fulgham, who's going to retire this year, we're pretty much it. So we are a small program. But hopefully we take good care of our students. So if you'll indulge me a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about the parable of the sower. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns. The thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty and some sixty, some hundred. He said unto them, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. The parable of the sower explained how different hearers of the word would receive it. Some would not be receptive by the wayside. Some hearers jump at the word and grow, but without deep roots on rocky ground, they would soon perish. Some hearers would grow up among weeds and be outcompeted, but some would be receptive and have good, deep earth to grow in. Thank you for attending the Biodiversity Conference at Humboldt State University. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you today about one of my favorite subjects, which is soils. And I hope our time together today will be deep soil, and you will put down deep roots of understanding. Now, while I don't have this bumper sticker on my car, the second part always makes me smile a little bit, although dirt is more appropriately called soil, and it's the very basis for life as we know it, us terrestrial beings. I want to take just a moment, give me a soapbox and I'll take advantage of it, Bobby. Uh, I want to take just a moment and talk about a very special degree program here at Humboldt State University. It's called Range Resource Science and it has options in range science and wildland soils. And believe it or not, it's the only undergraduate range degree in California. And it's one of the most important programs in the state of California to learn about soils, especially wildland soils. So our students take these courses in soils. These are available. They take um, introductory soil science, which a lot of students take, forest and range soils, origin and classification of soils, soil physics, soil microbiology, soil fertility, and wetland soils and agroforestry. So if you want to learn more about this, let me know. Um, when I teach soil microbiology, I have the best opportunity to talk about soil diversity itself. Soil is where biodiversity lives. Today we'll talk about the evidence for soil biodiversity using molecular approaches just a little bit because I'm not sure of my audience today, so I'm not going to teach the whole soil microbiology course in uh, about a half an hour. Secondly, we'll take a look at how soil ecology kind of compares to uh, more traditional mac or macroecology. Thirdly, we'll touch upon global conversations about soils and food supply. And then finally, I'd like to talk about um, awareness of the importance of soils in the general public. It's really undergone a, a tremendous um, up, uprising, if you will, and I think it's interesting to look at that. Okay. Up until about 20 years or so ago, most known soil microorganisms were isolated with selective media, like on the petri dish that um, Jana Miller is looking at at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories. But not all soil organisms can be cultured on petri dishes. In 1990, Torsvik and others published an article that described DNA reassociation rates that led them to believe that in one gram of soil, there were at least 4,000 completely different genomes of standard soil bacteria. And just to give you a reference, a dime weighs about a gram. So in a gram, there were 4,000 different genomes. 
And reassociation is a technique where the time necessary for single-stranded DNA to uh, rejoin complementary strands is measured. And when there are a few kinds of complementary strands, they find each other very quickly. But when there are many different kinds of strands, think biodiversity, it takes a lot longer for the strands to reassociate. So sometimes my students, I tell them, um, imagine that you were at a big dance party and you could only dance with people that had a complimentary color t-shirt on or something. If everybody, you know, if it was kind of half and half and you could just find somebody with the opposite color, it would go very quickly. But if there are 47 different kinds of t-shirt colors, it would take a long time for you to find that complimentary strand. So by measuring the time it takes for reassociation, they do some calculations and they have some standard uh, DNA to compare it to. And that's how they came to this conclusion that, gee whiz, we have a lot more in here than we thought we had in soils. Um, Kirk et al. wrote a nice article about methods of studying microbial diversity in 2004. About 1% of the soil bacterial population can be cultured by standard laboratory practices. And um, actually, I, went, I skipped over a slide there. It's not known if this 1% is representative of the bacterial population or not. It's stuff that grows on petri dishes, that's all. Um, furthermore, there's an estimated 1.5 million species of fungi that exist in the world. And many of those fungi that occur in soils can't be uh, cultured by standard laboratory methods. They're very slow, they tend to be very slow growing. So the identification of soil fungi is being studied using molecular approaches, but it lags behind the study of bacteria in general. And yet it's very important. Fungi are very important for uh, bringing phosphorus to plants, for example, through mycorrhizal associations. What have molecular approaches told us about soil bi biodiversity? Here's another study. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see that most of those six diagrams kind of have a downward trend. And um, across the bottom here is agricultural intensification, so more intensive agriculture to the right. This study was done across soils types and different land uses in the Sacramento Valley, showing that higher agricultural intensification based on field and landscape indices was negatively correlated with richness and diversity of plant and soil taxa and was related to indicator of ecosystem functions such as increased soil nitrate and phosphorus loading decreased riparian health ratings, and lower soil carbon, soil microbial biomass, and soil food web structure. In this study, researchers identified nematodes and also studied soil microorganisms using characteristics of cell wall structure using PLFA, which is phospholipid fatty acid analysis. So different organisms have different makeup in their cell walls, and they used that as an indicator of what was happening to these soil critters. Stated simply, the more intensively humans disturb the soil through cultivation and other activities, the lower the soil biodiver biodiversity. And other studies have shown that soil fungi decrease with increasing disturbance, largely because of disruptions of networks of fungal hyphae. Let's move on to our second topic, which is informed by studies using molecular approaches. How does soil ecology compare to macroecology or traditional ecology? How does it compare to elephants and gazelles or something like that? Um, in 2002, David Wardle wrote a book titled Communities and Ecosystems Linking the Above Ground and Below Ground Components. And um, this book spawned a lot of discussion and research. I used this book in soil microbiology some years back as a point of discussion. And in this slide, we see the classic trophic pyramid for traditional above ground ecosystems. So what's this right here? I need some audience participation. Plants. Plants. Okay, give me an example of this right here. What's that? Elephants? Okay. And it goes on up. You might have a hawk. Did any of you see hawks or owls at the demonstration today? There you go, mountain lion. And usually, um, the plants are the main source of photosynthesis, as you said, and make up a large part of the en energy with diminishing roles as you go up in the trophic pyramid. And soil organisms are usually kind of added maybe as an afterthought in a general, as a general term as decomposers, and it's left at that. 
However, if we move to the soil food web, we see that the role of primary producers or photosynthesizers is limited primarily, primarily to algae growing right at the Earth's surface, within just a few millimeters of where the light penetrates. So there's not a lot of primary productivity in the soil food web explicitly. The soil dwelling consumers are much smaller here in the soil. There's a micro food web consisting of bacteria and fungi, and these organisms break down plant and animal tissues and importantly release plant nutrients to soil solution. Then the middle level consists of the litter transformers. I like to call them the shredders. The shredders um, include organisms like springtails and nematodes and protozoans. And these animals transform plant and other organic materials into smaller pieces that have an increased surface area for attack by primary consumers and other secondary consumers. Finally, at the top of the so soil food web are larger animals that change the physical characteristics of the soils. And these have been termed ecosystem engineers. These include earthworms, termites, millipedes, and things of this nature. They're larger and they're able to build channels and other structures that dramatically influence the movement of water and air and soil. So they may not have as much of a chemical influence as they do a physical influence in the soil. Got some pictures here since I can't talk about nematodes and springtails without showing how cute they are. Um, what's very interesting about nematodes, and a lot of people um, promote use of nematodes alone, to indicate soil health is that they occupy just about every functional niche in soils. And they're oftentimes grouped by their mouth parts here. So these are the, oops, that's not the pointer. These are the mouth parts here of nematodes. A are ones that ingest by bacteria. Um, B is one with a little stylet there. It's got a little stiletto hidden back there in its mouth and it pierces roots and fungal hyphae. Some have um, piercing kind of apparatus and they feed on plants. Some feed on protozoa, slurping them up, and some are omnivores. So they have all kinds of different functional roles the nematodes do in soil. Springtails are pretty cute. This is called a little furcula and it allows them to jump, jump around. They're little invertebrate critters. And as one goes deeper into the dark soil uh, where it's denser and um, they're, they don't get up to the light as much. These and other creatures have less pigmentation and fewer protruding body parts to ease their passage through the pores. So this is enigmatic or charismatic, charismatic microfauna. Charismatic microfauna, not just macrofauna. There's some pretty cute things in there that do important things in the soil. Then we have the, earth, uh, the earthworms and termites and ants. These are the earth the ecosystem engineers, and they're both native and introduced, and they create, create macropores, and of course they consume plant material and make earthworm castings and stuff. They're slimy, and their they're slime, as they move through soils, kind of coats soil pores and compacts it, and actually their movement, and not, it's not just the pore, but what they do to the walls of the pore that creates microhabitat for smaller animals. There will be many more bacteria along that slimy wall that they created than other places in the soil. Just as there's much more microbiological activity around roots, that's called the rhizosphere. Termites and ants, if you go to the tropics or if you go to the desert southwest, um, are much more prevalent. And what's interesting about termites and ants too, termites especially since they, um, because of their symbiotic relationships in their guts, they're able to um, break down cellulose. And so if you, look at, if you look up references about sources of methane emissions, it's not just about cows. It's about those nasty little cow termites, too, with, that eat cellulose, that emit a lot of methane gas. So don't forget the termites when you're talking about methane emissions. OK, so to kind of wrap it up a little bit, Soil ecology compared to macroecology, primary productivity in soil is very much, you have to look at the above ground productivity, the plants that are growing on top. Above ground primary productivity and animal life relies on soil biodiversity and soil fabric arrangement for slow release, and water, slow release of water and nutrients. 
the primary consumers in this case, the microflora and the microfauna, are oftentimes very difficult to observe and very difficult to identify. Um, once you go in and move soil around, you've pretty much changed the spatial arrangement of their habitat. There are new techniques coming online where we can study these things intact, but most of the time, you know, we put them in a blender or slurry them out onto a petri dish, and it's not really like their, their native habitat, so that's pretty difficult to get down to. Um, because they're so small and because uh, a lot of characters perform the same kinds of duties, one approach is to organize these organisms more by function than by who they are. What do they do, not who are they or what's their genome necessarily, although their genome will tell you what, uh, what their genes allow them to do as well. So you might look at groups of cellulose degraders or nitrogen ammonifiers in some studies without really knowing who it is that's doing it. It's a consortia that's doing it and, and maybe many players. Now this, um, this next study was interesting and it, there's a lot of detail in it, but I think uh, a person to watch in this whole business is Diana Wall. Uh, she's at Colorado State University. If you want to study about soil ecology, that's where I would recommend that you go. Um, she used to be Diana Freckman when I was at UC Riverside a long, long time ago, and she was the head of the nematology department. There was a nematology department at Riverside. I'm not sure if it's still there. But she has done some tremendous work in terms of soil ecology and uh, ecosystem services and lots of other stuff. So in this paper, uh, they were modeling the effects of so loss of soil diversity on ecosystem function. Their hypothesis was that the loss of some species or functional groups might be compensated for by changes in abundance of other species or functional groups such that ecosystem processes are unaffected. And uh, Wall and her co-author Hunt uh, were working on a short grass prairie ecosystem, which they had a lot of information about. And then they derived information from other studies as well. And they came up with a simulation model that uh, was constructed for carbon and nitrogen transfers among plants and functional groups of microbes and soil fauna. So they were trying to tie this whole soil food web together in terms of carbon and nitrogen. The 15 functional groups of microbes and soil fauna were deleted one at a time and the model was run to steady state. Only six of the 15 deletions led to as much as 15% change in abundance of a remaining group and only two deletions, bacteria and saprophytic fungi, led to extinctions of other groups. While the soil fauna as a whole were important for maintenance of plant production, no single faunal group had a significant effect. These results suggest that ecosystems could sustain the loss of some functional groups with little decline in ecosystem services because of compensatory changes in the abundance of surviving groups. This kind of echoes a trend that we think of may or may not be true in soil microbiology and in microbiology in general. And it's funny that I'm standing up here on a stage too because sometimes I tell my students it's like, the show, mo the show must go on. There's somebody in the wings. If, if the actor cacks on the stage and is gone, there is the chance that somebody will come in from the wings and take over that function. So that's kind of a thought about what happens in soils. However, this prediction probably depends on the nature and stabilizing mechanisms in this system, and these mechanisms are not fully understood. There's still a lot to understand about soil microbiology and soil food webs and what happens when one is depleted and another one comes in or another one doesn't come in to take over that function. Interesting work though. Colorado State University. Another thing that really influences um, our understanding and the way that we look at soils, um, these models like used by Hunt and Wall they're trying to predict soil responses to climate change and different kinds of land use management. So let's see if my students can name the state factors of soils. These were formalized by Hans Jenny. Okay, so which one's first? Climate. What's next? Organisms. Who is that? Hi, Crystal. Topography, landscape, parent materials. 
time and other factors. These are the state factors. The process is somebody said weathering. So weathering, uh, the processes, I didn't list them up here, but are additions, removals, transformations, and translocations. Those are the processes that are influenced by these state factors. So in looking at climate change, we're looking at, in, at isolation of that variable climate on some kind of ecosystem. But these are kind of depicted as being uh, independent variables, but they really aren't. They're all interconnected. So, OK. Um, for further reading, this may be the book to read and understand more recent research. I've got it on order. It's uh, concerning above ground and below ground interactions of soil organisms and terrestrial ecosystems, where these authors, uh, Bargett and Wardle, wrote separate books on, these, on this topic in 2002 and 2005. They've now joined forces to update, update the content together. So I can't wait to get this book. And if you're waiting to take soil microbiology, that might be one of your textbooks. Um, another interesting uh, and less technical work was published this summer in the Atlantic Monthly by Michael Amaranthus and Bruce Allen. It's called Healthy Soil Microbes and Healthy People. And some of the statements, this is soft literature, so they don't cite their sources. I put that caveat on it, but some of their statements are pretty amazing. Um, the single greatest leverage point for sustainable and healthy future for the 7 billion people on the planet is thus arguably immediately underfoot, the living soil where we grow our food. Overall, soil ecology still holds many mysteries. What Leonardo da Vinci said 500 years ago is probably still true today. We know more about the movement of celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot. Okay, come on. Though you never see them, 90% of all organisms on the seven continents live underground. In addition to bacteria and fungi, the soil is also filled with protozoa, nematodes, mites, and microarthropods. That's impressive, but wait till you get to this one. There can be 10,000 to 50,000 species. That's quite a bit more than the 4,000 that Torsvik postulated about. There can be 10,000 to 50,000 species in less than a teaspoon of soil. In that same teaspoon of soil, there are more microbes than there are people on Earth. Now, this varies quite a bit from one soil to the other. Not all soils are created equal, as some of my students know only too well right now in Soil 360, but uh, that's the magnitude of possibilities there. And finally, this is the one that you can tell your friends. In a handful of healthy soil, there's more biodiversity in just the bacterial community than you will find in all the animals of the Amazon basin. Are soils awesome or what? They're tiny. The stuff's tiny, but it's pretty awesome. OK. So just to summarize to this point, molecular and genetic, approach, uh, molecular and genetic approaches have just revolutionized soil microbiology and our understanding of soils. Soil ecology is linked to all other terrestrial ecology. They can't really be considered one without the other. And in addition, I think it's an important thing to point out that um, there's more carbon in soils than all the standing vegetation on the Earth's surface. This is uh, second only to uh, the carbon in the Earth's crust in the form of carbonates is greater, and the carbon in the Earth's oceans, in case there's any oceanography folks in the crowd, I don't want to ruffle their feathers. There's more in the ocean. Those are the biggest pools, but the next biggest pool is the carbon in soils. There's more carbon in soils, organic matter, living biota, and carbon dioxide than in all the standing terrestrial vegetation on the Earth's surface. Therefore, if somebody's talking about climate change, there must be a conversation about soils, or they're not getting the whole picture. OK. Since soils are the most important source of food production for our planet's human population and other living beings, soil sustainability is a critical conversation. That picture was taken yesterday at Farmer's Market, by the way. It was a beautiful day, and there were just beautiful colors all around. Sustainability means that human interactions with soils do not cause degradation of soil quality by causing negative feedbacks. And what I'm going to do is I've gone through and, and talk, I'm talking about a few papers uh, that have come out recently about 
conversations about food supply and how, what, what we need to do to feed the Earth's people. Palm and others, this is a huge paper, refer metaphorically to soil ecosystems as having three core properties, if you're going to simplify it down. Texture, mineralogy, and organic matter are the most important things. And most other properties that we learn about in soil science are derived from these, these properties. They're closely correlated. Spazito, a former um, professor of mine who's at Berkeley, writes that texture and mineralogy are kind of like genetic properties and that they're relatively unchanging. You get what you got from your parents. While organic matter is kind of like your diet, it's drawing an analogy between soil health and human health. So the organic matter is very important. And the main variables that humans can manage sustainably are what happens, how does the organic matter get back into the soil, trampled by animals, maintained through permaculture, et cetera, or compost application. And also, the other thing that we manage are water inputs, and the efficiencies of these are very important. OK. Foley and others um, had an article in Nature called Solutions for a Cultivated Planet. And uh, one thing that they say is that um, agricultural expansion is one way of increasing the global food supply. Unfortunately, it's happened mostly in tropical areas, and that has reduced the biodiversity of those areas, but it hasn't really increased global food production, although I should say that for the people that are living there, in the immediate area, it has probably increased their food supply. But on a, on a, in a big picture kind of sense, that kind of expansion hasn't really paid off very much. We've probably expanded into most of the arable, uh, culturable types of areas that we should. The other thing that they talk about as, a, as something that could increase food production is intensification. And this varies geographically and most dramatically increases food production, so dramatically that I had to put two C's in there, I guess. Um, so there are places where uh, there is room to intensify agriculture to make it more efficient. There are other situations, especially in this country, where we add too dang much to the soil that probably shouldn't be there, and resulting in environmental damage. Foley et al. go on and say that the transformation of agriculture should also, so these are the goals, these, this is what they aspire towards in terms of agriculture. It should cut greenhouse gas emissions from land use and farming by at least 80 percent. Agriculture should reduce, should um, not reduce biodiversity, but reduce biodiversity losses and habitat losses. Agriculture should reduce unsustainable water withdrawals, especially where, where, where water has competing demands for fisheries and so forth. And also that agriculture should phase out water pollution from agricultural chemicals. In some other papers um, along these lines where we're talking about water, some other papers talk about green water versus blue water. Raise your hand if you've heard of water discussed in this way. So green water is like the water that's in the soil, that's being taken up by plants, that's being transpired, that's being evaporated from soil surfaces, that's stored in soils. And blue water is more of the flowing water in streams, rivers, lakes, and so forth, fresh water there. There are a lot of efficiencies that we can still gain in the green water game. For example, if you grow crops in rows far apart where their canopies never overlap, you're going to lose a lot of water from the soil surface. On the other hand, if you have cropping strategies in the right plants and so forth, where the canopies can close over, they create a thicker boundary layer such that that green water can be used more efficiently by that crop. So there's a lot of very clever ways. Agriculture, I think, is much more sophisticated sometimes than we give it credit for in terms of what can be done to conserve resources, both nutrients and water. So that. That one is pretty interesting right there to me. OK. On the food security side, Foley et al. suggest that we stop expanding agriculture into wildlands because there's, there's, the good lands are taken up. The fertile soils are pretty much already occupied, and we need habitat for wildlife and so forth. They also recommend that we close yield gaps. So there are places in the world where 
the management of nutrients, water, and just crop growing can be improved with fairly simple fixes. They argue that we need to improve agricultural resource efficiency, and I think this is where they're talking about um, developed nations that have more than they know what to do with. So we are applying too many fertilizers, too many pesticides, cultivating too much, et cetera. So some are doing not enough and some are doing too much, and it's a very uh, site-specific kind of situation. The final recommendation is that we increase food delivery by shifting diets and by reducing waste. So much food is wasted uh, in this country and, and others as well. In summary, the whole thesis of their paper is talking about a balance of environmental goals, including soil biodiver biodiversity, along with food security goals. It's an interesting paper in nature. I'd encourage you to, to look it up. Okay, with that, I'd like to move on to our final point, which is to talk, this is a little bit more lighthearted and fun. Why did soils become so popular all of a sudden? I um, wish I could take some credit for it, but I don't think I can. This is a pretty big deal going on here. The Smithsonian, I remember when they were planning this, the Smithsonian had an exhibit between 2008 and 2010 called Dig It. And millions of people saw this. I got to see it in 2009 when I was on sabbatical. You can still go and see a virtual tour of this exhibit. Um, but it hit the East Coast. It hit Washington, D.C. It was there. There were soil profiles from every state and territory hanging on the walls. There were interactive things for kids to do. It was pretty awesome. We're in a camp campaign. We raised like $160 a couple of months ago for um, a campaign to get this same exhibit to come to the California Museum in Sacramento in 2015. So stay tuned. Uh, the Range and Soils Club may have some activities to help raise some more money for this. And contact me personally if you'd like to raise some money for this campaign. That would be pretty, pretty cool to have all that stuff come to California. Um, Okay, another thing I think that happened after the Smithsonian sort of kicked it off, there were some pretty cool uh, popular press books. Dirt, the Ecstatic Skin of the Earth was published in 1996 and reprinted in 2007. Raise your hand if you've read this. Yeah, okay. It's kind of written by a philosopher journalist, so he got some of the things wrong. I have a dog-eared book of his. He got some of his textures mixed up, but this, uh, it was, it's an interesting book, and it inspired Dirt the Movie, which has screened in Humboldt County a couple of years ago, and they have a website, too, the Dirt Movie. They're also on Facebook, so I get all kinds of cool stuff from them. Um, more popular press things. I don't think this book by David Wolf probably sold a lot of copies, but it's, it's, uh, it's really a neat one, Tales from the Underground, A Natural History of Subterranean Life, 2002. That's more, uh, I think Soils is, is very close to plant pathology. And in this book, he's more of a horticulturalist, and he talks about um, the potato famine, uh, diseases that have affected cocoa and, um, uh, cocoa and, and coffee, and there was one other one in there. So if you like plant pathology, if you're really into the micro, that's a good book to read. And then, uh, how many of you have read The Worst Hard Time? about the Dust Bowl, but wait, how many of you have seen the movie on PBS? Okay, there's one. Yeah, he's got some learning to do here. Uh, Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations is probably the one that most, I, I bet I'd put my money on this one as having uh, uh, sold the most copies. It, this David Montgomery is a geomorphologist, and he wrote a book about the loss of soil, too. Um, in 2011, our professional society, one of our professional societies, Soil Science Society of America, introduced a campaign, I Love Soil. Note, note that they're not calling it dirt. And um, they had stickers. They've got some quickie little public service announcements on their web page. And they also did a survey of employers and current students and recent graduates about what was lacking and what needed to be uh, updated and so forth. So that was a pretty big campaign led by just a few individuals. And then finally, this is the granddaddy of them all, I think, as far as getting people to remember a little bit about history 
and certainly probably the most historical point is that relates to soil in our country here, which was the Dust Bowl. So how many of you saw the Dust Bowl on PBS? One, two, three, four. Don't watch enough TV. Okay. It was, it was okay. It was very much in line with the, uh, the Egan book. Yeah, and Ken Burns. So they didn't talk about the science of it, but it was interesting. I have a cousin that had an artifact in his lungs that when he went into the army, they saw that there. It was something that had gotten into his lungs from the Dust Bowl. He's 80 years old now. He's a farmer in South Dakota. So he remembers it. If you have members of your family that remember this time, you should talk to them and remember their stories before they're gone. Those folks are getting up there. Okay. Um, this is where the booth goes on alert. We're not going to watch these videos right now, but I have them lined up here. Uh, there's a Global Soils Week that's happening just in a couple of weeks in Berlin. Darn, got to teach, can't go there. But um, this is an international issue, and the Europeans are getting on the bandwagon. So we're going to watch their uh, award-winning animation here in just a few minutes. Let's talk about soil. And in 2015, the year when our program has to have 50 majors, if you want to be a soils major, talk to me or a range major, but in the year 2015, the United Nations has designated it as the International Year of the Soil. And they also have a little publicity thing on YouTube that we're going to watch. They don't take too long. And I have plenty of time left, so we're going to watch them. So by some estimates, soils contain 25% of the planet's biodiversity. Soil ecosystems are being studied and integrated with other disciplines. Here at Humboldt State, we have many more enlightened botanists that take a soils class, even though they don't have to, but they should. Um, soils produce food. It filters and digests waste and slowly releases water and nutrients. And I would put forth to you that soils are the hot topic globally at the beginning of this 21st century in terms of environmental attention Behold, there went out a sower to sow, and some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Arable and biodiverse soils are limited resources. And some fell among thorns. The thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. We must be wise in the way that we use soils to grow food and for other purposes. And other fell on good ground, did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty and some sixty, some a hundred. He said unto them, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Soils are important. They are where we begin, they are what sustain us, and ultimately where we find our final resting place. They should be treated with reverence and curiosity and delight. Thank you very much. And now if the booth will... Cue up that uh, first video. Let's watch it. While they're doing that, does anybody have any questions? Yes. You know, right in the beginning, you had uh, Oleon. You had this slide about the study that scientists can be recommended uh, by another scientist. And they found that two of 15, uh, uh, you know, of their uh, group were not affected by the disturbance that they introduced. Right. Hunt so and Wall. Right. And then in their conclusion, they discounted that and said, oh, yeah, we can disturb the soil. It doesn't do much damage. They but said, I, mean, they, they said I, can, I can quote you, they yeah, said that the ecosystems could sustain the loss of some functional groups, but they also said that the mechanisms, the stabilizing mechanisms in the system still weren't very well understood. Yeah, I, that first part of the conclusion doesn't seem to follow because, I mean, because of the, even the second part, you know, if we remove, let's say we damage the saprophytic plants, you know, somehow, or introduce something that started wiping them out broadly, um, there'd be some incredible uh, consequences. And I'd just like to suggest that the loss of some species, you know, it's not acceptable to lose 2% of the species. 
not acceptable to use one percent of the species, and that's what they're suggesting. Is that it's acceptable to lose some species? I think, though, what they're what they recognize too is that in that system, it's a model. If you go out, if you go out and fumigate a field, for example, if if in prior days you went out and fumigated a, a strawberry field with uh, methyl bromide and killed everything, including saprophytic fungi, what would happen? What's your prediction of what would happen? If that field were abandoned of strawberry culture, it, w it would come back. It's, they're on the stage waiting to come back. As long as there are islands and propagation and dispersion, it may or may not be irreversible. Okay. That's the amazing thing about soils, because it's so complex, it's so resilient, and it's so resistant, too. For example, sometimes my students get very concerned about p when they measure pH, and they're concerned that during the rainy season maybe the pH changes or something, and I say, you know, I don't think it's going to change more than what you can detect with your, your kit there. It's so resilient and it's so resistant to change, and likewise it recovers pretty dramatically. Another, another thing that hopefully um, puts this in a better context. I was talking with Jacques Newcomb yesterday at Farmer's Market, and he said, you got to come out and see this field that I've got. I've been growing cover, cover crops on it, and when we first got the property, it was, you know, you could lift it up and it would be kind of hard and difficult to break apart. And he says, now you lift it up when it's moist and just earthworms crawling all over it. There are things that we can do, and it is pretty resilient. So okay. that's cool. Okay, got the video? Ready to go? She gave me the thumbs up. I can see this little light-colored hand out there. So this is from... We are looking. We walk all over it. Travel it every Why day. Why turn out the lights here? Yet we need it. Like the air we breathe. We could probably use a little bit more it's volume. It's about time that we talk about soil. Yeah. It's certainly about time that we start protecting. and states have realized this. The race for the soils of the world has already begun. Land grabbing, often with questionable means for questionable purposes. Millions of hectares of land change owner every year. The price, ruined lives, uprooted families. Usually, these are the poorest of the poor. Often, they have no choice. They destroy the forest because they need land to survive. We need healthy and fertile soil now more than ever. Projections say the available arable land per Earth inhabitant will be reduced by half by 2050. 
but already today, one million people go to bed hungry night after night. That's one billion people too many, and this number will increase every day if we do not distribute soil fairly. If we do not increase yields dramatically on every piece of land, or simply discover a second earth, then we might not want to rely on that. Soil and land issues rarely get our attention, or that of our policy makers. We see the full supermarket shelves and believe that things will stay like this forever. We live on credit at the expense of soils, but they are not inexhaustible. We take out money from a bank account into which we never make any deposits. One day, this account will be empty our credit overdrawn, and our soils will be gone. But there is good news. We have long known what we must do in order to preserve soils for our children. Let's remember, soil is a sensitive living being who wants to be taken care of. It is not a factory. Everyone has a right to soil. This right must be safeguarded by the law. And we cannot afford to bury our livelihood under a leg of Asha. Now it's up to us. We must open our eyes and find ways to apply our knowledge. So we don't end up losing the ground. Pretty cool animation. How about the next one for um, International Year of the Soil? There's one other piece uh, that's coming out. Uh, it's called the Symphony of Soil, the Symphony of Soil. And uh, some of our HSU students are going to the soils meetings in um, Tampa, Florida, here in a couple of weeks, in about a month. And hopefully they'll screen it there. It's called the, Sym the Symphony of Soil. It's not out quite yet, but that's going to be another piece to add to our uh, resources to spread the word about soils. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned when you were speaking about um, pesticides and about how um, you know we don't feel like agriculture is treating our soils or something. And um, I was wondering what what the potential for soil infiltration devices in the agricultural fields are in the, in the um, toxicity of pesticides in the water. 
Um, each each site is very specific. It's very there's a very site specific context to it, and I'm not here as an apolo as an apologist, but I do know that when um, pesticides, including herbicides, are um, oh it's not the word isn't licensed, but um, I'm trying to think of the word. But when they're uh, allowed to go out into the environment by EPA and others, there are prescriptions about amounts that can be put on. And that's a function of cell texture and cell organic matter because those things absorb quite a bit of those pesticides. So there's no simple answer to your question. It's very context important. Uh, I, I would tend to say yes, uh, and the assumption is is that herbicides and other kinds of pesticides will have some kind of far-reaching impact. There have been studies that I'm familiar with with the Reading Forest Service lab that looked at the impact of herbicides on uh, actinorhizal associations, like on a lot of the native shrubs and stuff. They did not find an impact. So in some cases, there is no impact, except on the intended target, which was an above ground thing. So really complex question, don't know. Um, some of them, like methyl bromide, just kill about just about everything. But like I said, after a certain amount of time with its removal, there, there is hope. Uh, some of them are a lot worse than others. Yes, sir. My answer is, yeah. <laughs> it really is complex. And they're, they're, um, one of the things that, um, that Wardle talked about in his book that I'm sure is in the 2010 book, too, is there's a big discussion about litter quality. So there are different kinds of inputs of organic matter to soils that are very different. And this is what our students learn in Soil 260. The first thing to go are things like carbohydrates, starches, sugars, and proteins. They get biodegraded really fast and do get off-gassed as CO2 very quickly. On the end of the other, the other end of the spectrum is what, you guys? What's the really resistant kind of litter or organic material that can be in soil? Lignin. Lignin, or even farther than that, humus. Um, there have been studies looking at um, isotopes from different time periods that show that some organic matter is thousands of years old. Even, and we're not even talking about buried coal and peat moss or anything, you know, dramatic like that. We're talking about in ordinary soils, some fractions are a thousand years old, some are a hundred years old, some are decades, some would be gone within weeks if you added sugar, you know, to soil. So, so there tends to be, when there's an input of organic matter, there tends to be an initial flush if the organisms are in good conditions of aeration and moisture and pH and other nutrients that might be limiting. When you first put in that slug of organic matter, much of that may go off as CO2, but a great portion of it is stable and resistant to degradation. So it's, it's really calculus. It really is calculus and isotopic an analysis that's the answer to your question. And there's been, there's been a lot of studies of that within microcosms, which are very kind of fakey little bags of soil. That's, that's what they started doing these studies with. Now they're doing more in situ type stuff. Um, but some of it sticks around for a long, long time. I think one of the, the things in agriculture in this country that has grown by leaps and bounds is called conservation tillage or no-till. And what tends to happen with that, the farmers don't go, go in and turn over the soil quite as much. They don't tend to aerate it quite as much. And ironically, the less well aerated it is, the more that carbon is preserved. Because aerobic uh, breakdown is much more efficient than anaerobic breakdown. That's why we ferment foods to keep them longer, right? Foods and other liquid types of, kinds of things. 
So no-till has, is, uh, tends to store more carbon, allow more fungal hyphae to grow and, and establish. It plays out in some big, big trends in the country, and our, our policies have encouraged that too. Sorry. <laughs> the, question, the, the question was age of organic matter in that sense, and the other was a question about pesticides. Yes. She's a, she's, she's a paid employee of the biodiversity <coughs> campus. Uh, the question was kind of the thought or the model that something is waiting in the wings to take over. I don't know. It's kind of, it's, it's analogous to island biogeography, but it's, it's very much context driven. How close are the propagules? Um, what are the conditions that allow that organism to thrive and grow? How did it get there? For restoration folks, there's a lot of people studying restoration at Humboldt State, and they know if they've listed in their soils classes that you have to take the appropriate organisms with you when you plant into mined land to reclaim it. You have to take the organisms with you into that harsh environment, otherwise your sagebrush is going to die. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, the question was, the complexity defies easy explanation to the public. Um, what did you think of those videos? A lot of people don't know chemistry. They don't know about carbon and soils. I think the, the thing that we have going for us, maybe, this, I'm, I'm reaching here a little bit, but those with more education might be able to embrace the complexity with a little less trouble. On the other hand, those with less education are probably closer to the soil in the first place. They probably know from experience and from stories passed down what is the thing to do and what is the thing not to do for their particular context. Indigenous knowledge cannot be discounted. Anything else? Yeah. What do you think about biochar? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Biochar. What do I think about biochar? Um, I don't know what I think about biochar, but it's a really hot topic at the conferences now. Uh, that is basically people wanting to put impartially burned stuff like charcoal in the soil. Lasts a long time, can be a great filter. Sounds pretty energy intensive to me right on the face of it, but I, am, I look forward to learning more. Do you have an opinion about it? Um, I think it's a good idea. I mean, people are experimenting with it. Yeah. It might be an Amazon piece of work to do the next hop to me. But when you make the biochar, you get uh, charcoal plus things that can last a few days or days or two. That's right. Yeah. I think it's I think biochar is definitely worth thinking about and experimenting with to evaluate fully. Okay. That's I think I heard the bells outside. We're done. Thanks for coming.